please take a seat. And just before I invite Donnie to come up to give his testimony, I just want to give a testimony on top of the testimony, in that just before the, the pandemic really kicked in and churches and stuff were closed and whatever else, Donnie started to come along to shout In fact, Rodney there had contacted me in advance and said to me, listen, there's a mate of mine who's given his life to Jesus and there's any chance he could come along to your church. I said, we're open for anybody. And then we saw Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I have to say, since he came through the doors of this church, you can see without any doubt in this man that God has touched his life. Yeah. And I'm looking forward yeah. to hearing this evening just what God has done. He's a faithful, faithful brother in Christ and I thank God for him. Donnie, you want to come forward? for 25 years. I had a problem with drugs and I'll tell you about it. I won't tell you about it, but I'll Don't want to have a name for But uh, I grew up in up. Me, my sister, my mum and dad. My dad was part-time EDR, drove a lorry. My mum was working in Gallagher's, I think. Lived at the bottom of up for a few years. And then, I'm going to piss up and down here. <laughs> Lived at Ballyup for a few years, then we moved up to Beverly. My dad joined the RUC, so we did. And we lived in Beverly for a few years. And then my mum and dad split up. And it was very hard when you were young, when your mum and dad splits up. Because you don't understand that, and I think I was seven years old. So it was, and uh, it was hard going, so it was. But I used to cry myself to sleep for my dad. I missed him. And I remember one time coming out of school, my dad used to pick me up after school. And I remember one time coming out and he wasn't there. And I walked up the road, crying my eyes out, and then my dad appeared. But it, to see a face, I said to my dad, I got beat up by two fellas, or two big boys. <laughs> And for the next hour, my dad drove about looking for these two of my three people. But one of the good things I can remember back then was he used to pick me up from school in a meat wagon. So he had all his mates in the back, or sometimes it was a big red Ford Cortina, a big bulletproof one. I thought I was a big one. So we went on to Mum and Dad split up, my mum moved back to Ballyhoff. Me and my sister lived with my mum. Normal childhood, football, getting into trouble. <laughs> uh, went to Sunday school, loved it. Got a Bible for best attendance and all. Yeah. So I did. Yeah. But then went to Hillsway College. That's, I could probably read a book in Hillsway College. I, I was suspended three times, expelled once, got back in because my dad went up and seen Ed Master after I got expelled. I was saying something to him. I got back in. But all through school, Right, just normal. Like, like, normal as normal can be, you know what I mean? But uh, when I was 16, uh, I joined a certain organisation, a certain faction. And my dad used to always say to me, Don, see whatever you do, join the police. Brilliant career. Something different every day. And by the time I was 20, I had about seven criminal convictions. So that was out the window. So it was. But uh, when I was 21, my son was born, Ross. And about four months later, I was shot by my so called friends in a so called punishment attack. 
Suppose, and I'll give you a wee bit of an insight into my thinking back there. Suppose I was laying up this empty, and we I've got farmer's field, and the blood was going through my legs. And I pulled my leg up, and there was smoke coming out of one of the holes. And do you know what I was raging about? My jeans. <laughs> <laughs> I, bought, I bought them on the Saturday, and it cost me any quid. I was saying to myself, I see them boys, you better be getting money for the gym. <laughs> That's what I was saying. So, my 20s, I'll be totally honest about my 20s. Don't remember. 100 cent. 100 cent. Party. Party central. See if it was a party? I was there. Every weekend, just breezing through. Party and party. I actually remember going to the shop for a pint of milk one time and ended up on a train to Port Rouge for three days. <laughs> <laughs> So there was a party I was there, just all three legs. I said a wee bit off the rails of all this, to be honest. But that went on, that went on. My daughter was born. And then everybody has situations in life that stands out and it affects them and stuff. Or maybe stands out and you remember it. One of them was when your children were born, obviously, probably one of the ones when I was shot, and then the next one was probably when my mum died. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about my mum. She was a lovely woman, stood beside me between, I don't think I heard her. She was was saying me between seconds in, anything I done, please shut the door anything. She was always there for me. I remember even a police trying to get in the front door one time, she was holding it shut, tell me to get out the back. <laughs> <laughs> but she was, loved animals. She had a wee animal sanctuary and she'd give all the money to animals. Our house was coming down with cats and dogs and you couldn't sit down and say, get up and get covered in hair and stuff like that. But my mum had battled cancer and beat it, and then got cancer again, and then beat it, and then I was out with her one time in the Naka Lodge, and was watching her, and she was eating, and she was dipping her chicken in ice cream, and I was like, what are you doing, Mum? So I didn't know I was doing that, but the cancer had spread to her brain, so it had, and a couple of weeks later she got diagnosed, she had only months to live, but I can remember, Watch my mum die in the house. I'll try not to get him from here. Well, and she was in so much pain, so much pain. And I was glad when they put her on there, on the driver. So that, but my mum held on for like two weeks and she should have been away in days. And I always say she held on because she didn't want to leave me. Because yeah. she knew I was going to go off the rails, you know what I mean? But uh, I remember the night she died. I was, I was at the bank, I was up in the morning, I think it was 2013, and I was having a smoke, and a uh, McMillan nurse, I think it was, or Mary Curie, came down and she said, Dawn, it's time. And I was like, I never thought I'd hear them words. I never thought my mum was going to die. You, you don't prepare for them, things like that. And I went up, and I knelt beside her bed, and I held her hand, and I said to her, Mum, just go. You'll be all right. I'll be all right. But I knew I wasn't going to be all right. So then, and my mum opened her eyes, stared into mine, and shut her eyes, and that was her way. And it broke my heart. And I was devastated. So it was I, I knew I was going to go for real, hundred percent. So I actually ended up going to church for a year, and I just I didn't feel it. It wasn't my time, so it wasn't at church and I ended up after a year or so started dabbling in drugs and then I dabbled in drugs big time and I was taking drugs every weekend and during the week and taking drugs into work with me and it was a mess and I was spending loads of money in drugs loads of money so it was if I got that that wee bit of that wee bit of happiness for an hour and then got another 12 hours of depression, that wee bit of happiness for an hour was worth it in my head back then. You know what I mean? But it just made me so depressed and so 
No, I mean, I'm not going out for walks when I was on the drugs, like years into them. And see, see when you're on drugs, right? See when it becomes, it's not a social thing no more where you do with your friends and all, and it becomes an anti social thing. You're locking your door and you're closing your blinds, you're turning your phone off, and you're getting wasted by yourself. You know you've got a problem with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was at. So I was terrible states, terrible states. But this went on, this went on for ages, ages and ages. So it did. I was saying something there and then I went into something else and forgot what I was saying previously. <laughs> but I'll get there, I'll get there. But this went on for ages, years, drugs, 10 years. While in the drugs, so it was. And I used to go out for walks. And I was that depressed and I was that low. And I used to look at the trees to hang myself. So I did, and I used to, I was fed up with life, you know what I mean, I wasn't living, I was existing. So I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't a life. So I wasn't, I wasn't a nice person. I wasn't there for my son. I wasn't there for my daughter. I wasn't there for my family. I counted, nobody else counted. As long as I was getting that high, and I'd had money for that high, that's all that mattered in my life. I mean, nobody mattered, nobody. I was selfish. So I was, and I remember one night, I tidied my flat up, spotless, and I ran the bath, and I got in the bath, and I was going to slice my wrist. And I sat in the bath for ages, and I couldn't drag that knife down my wrist. So I couldn't. And I got out of the bath, and I kneeled on the floor and cried, and I pleaded with God just to let me get it over with. That's how far depression overtook me. So the drugs, Obviously, God didn't, I'm here tonight. Like, or, obviously, the devil didn't give me that time, because I'm here tonight. But my drug went on for another year or so, and I have to give this girl a mention, like, because she's probably, she said she wasn't going to watch, but she is going to watch. <laughs> she says, but she was my friend in school, and then after my mum died, she contacted me. About a month after mum, I've always said, we've always said that your mum's in me to look after me. Married, lived in Carrick, beautiful family, beautiful husband. And see if it wasn't for her, I think I would be with. Because she made sure at days when my car to get to work. She would have phoned in work sick for me. She would have made sure money, food in the cupboard, because I was spending all my money. I, I calculated it up. See, over the 10 years, well over £120,000 drugs. Easy. Easy. Man, absolutely man. And see, think of back now. Right? You're like, God, we really like that. I cringe, think of that. So that, so, the week, this went on for years, years, years. My family didn't know, my friends didn't know the, the heck of it. And it was actually Carol that told my family that I was a drug addict. And I went mental at her. So it was, but she was right, you know what I mean? She was right. And this went on, the week before, this brings me up, the week before I got saved, I'd been on a bender for five days, locked the door out of it. Couldn't remember nothing, no sleep, nothing. Five days, just by myself, pops of fog. I spent, I think I spent over two grand on coke, which I didn't have. I had to get off my sister. Got an army bit of trouble that week as well. And I went to bed for three days. And I woke up on a Sunday. And I went in the bathroom and looked in the mirror and I was like, who are you? I mean, who is this person? What have you became? And it, I just, I was like looking at somebody else, you know what I mean? And I was starving. And I got in the car and I went down the garage to get a rustler's burger. So then, and I was at the garage and I met my friend up here. who had been saved months previously. And I heard about Ricky being saved and I've known him all my life. And I was talking to Ricky at the garage and I was looking at him and I was going, he was glowing. And he was just coming across the way he was coming across. And I was saying to myself, I need that. I need that in my life. Yeah. So did. And I was walking away from Ricky. And Ricky said to me, Don, I've got your name wrote in my Bible to get saved. And I was like, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. And I got in the car and went up home. And went out for a walk and came back and I got down on my knees and I asked God into my heart. Yeah. 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 And you know what didn't happen? 
The heavens didn't clear, there was 12 heavenly angels playing congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a light that bolt up the arse or anything. <laughs> but, uh, I knew for the first time in my life I'd done something that meant something. I knew in my heart that this was, this was the beginning of my life. So what? But it was during lockdown, so it was. It was lockdown. I went to bed that night and I got up the next morning and the cloud had lifted. I knew exactly what I had to do. So I did. I just knew where I had a direction and I knew where I was heading. And I dusted my Bible off and I read the Bible in two weeks. So then I didn't take it all in off. So like and I'm half I'm nearly through it again. I'm starting to try and digest it more. So yeah. And I arranged to meet the powers of be and told them that I was only taking my orders from God now. And they weren't, uh, they weren't too happy about it, but there were two onions. I'll <laughs> 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 uh, uh, just say, if God's with us, we can be a gangster. Yes. You know what I mean? yes. So, my life's totally changed, honest. You know what I mean? I haven't touched a drug in nearly two years. I haven't touched a drink in two years. I think I've become a better person. But it, it, was, kind of, it was kind of like hard for me. Because it was during lockdown. And I had Rodney texting me and I had Ricky texting me for encouragement. And I had my Bible and that's all I had there. And I had no church. So then, but about a month previous to that, I'd been looking to move to get away from the drugs. And find out Danica D for a new start. And uh, I got a call and I got a wee apartment down here. <clears throat> so then I was in a few days and Tally was telling part of my story or spoiling my speech. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Rodney, Rodney had phoned me and he said, what church are you going to go to? And I was like, I don't know, mate. I'll, I'll probably go round a few and see, see how it goes. So well, I'll find my home and he, Rodney said, right, right, right. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll phone you in a minute. And then he phoned me back and he says, okay, I'm going to phone you. And that was Taddy Gordon. And I had a wee chat with Taddy, and it was still locked down. And he says, We're online, you can watch it every Sunday. But I've never told you, Taddy. Said I used to watch it. Said I used to watch it on a Sunday. I used to go to myself, that's some group they have up there. <laughs> the songs are playing. It wasn't until the first Sunday I walked through that door. And I was like, Where's the group? <laughs> but, uh, you know what I mean? God, God's changed my life so many ways. So many people, people say to me, this is the only bit I'm going to read from the I wrote the whole story, so I said, but I didn't want to be monotone. So then, but, but, uh, of, uh, you know what I mean? People say to me, and oh, all, what's God, what's God done? Why are you done? What's, what's changed? You know what I mean? What have you gained? And I, I've lost, I've lost that. You know what I mean? I've lost the depression, the addiction, the despair, yeah, the sorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I've lost this here big cloud that used to follow me everywhere. Just doom, gloom, doom, gloom. You know what I mean? I've gained, I've gained a new father. I've gained family. I've gained a church. I've gained direction. I've gained peace in my heart. Yes. I've gained hope. Yes. I've gained love. I've gained contentment. I've gained countless blessings. Praise the Lord. And you know, I mean, I, I see the end days, the dark days. I mean, I bounce out of bed in the morning. You know what I mean? I don't, I sleep well. I never used to sleep good. I sleep well, I bounce out of bed. I'm happy. And I was talking to, I was talking to Karen earlier the week. And I was saying to Karen, you know, it's, it's weird because there's things happening in my life and I'm going to myself, why am I not worrying about that? Because mm -hmm. all the police took all my worries away. Mm -hmm. so, so that's basically where it leads me to me. You know, I mean, I came through the circle and this is how I'm standing here in front of you tonight. Yeah, yeah. And that's basically my story. Oh,
comes up to the big room. You know, it's amazing what people think, you know, when you become a Christian, this is if, you know, God sort of does a, a, a frontal uh, lobotomy and sort of takes out your sense of humor and takes out, you know, any joy in your life. And sometimes when you look at Christians, they do have cases like Lord of Spades. And, and, and uh, what a joy it is to know Jesus, you know. And that says many times to church, you know, if that's joy, I'll, I'll do without things. But with Donny, you can see, you can see the joy. Yeah. Now, yeah. speaking of joy, this is where I'm going to take everybody's joy away because I've got, I've got to listen to him now. <laughs> Donny says, and the whole time I'm sitting up, where he said to me during the week, I said, what verse are you going to be reading? He says, I never knew I had to read a verse from the Bible. I said, well, you don't, there's only verse. He says, I, I like that in the way if God is for us, who can be against us. I said, now make sure you say it. And I said to him yesterday morning, we're at the men's breakfast. Now make sure you say it, because my whole talk's based on it. So I'm glad he said that other night, you know, if God be for us, who can be against us? And he mentioned that. And it means this, when, when you hear it, if God is for us, who can be against us? It means if God favours us, who would ever imagine that God Almighty, who created all things, could favour human beings, sinners? But if God favours us, if he's on our side, we have the brass neck as Christians to be able to say, God is on our side. It means that even though we face whatever we face in life, we don't need, as Donnie says, we don't need to worry about anything because God has our back. However, it doesn't mean that Christians won't face opposition. It doesn't mean that Christians won't be oppressed at times. It doesn't mean that we won't face difficult or challenging times. Absolutely no doubt Donny has and he will face many such challenges in life. But he has the Lord on his side. He has the Lord who favours him. And if God is for him, who can be against him? One who has the favour of God. Although he still faces opposition, although he still faces oppression or difficult, challenging times, because God is on his side, he will give him the strength to get through whatever it is that he has to face. Just because Christians know the Lord, it doesn't mean they're exempt from hardship. In fact, God's word says the complete opposite. God's word says all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. That's not some, That's not an invitation. Come on, everybody, and put your trust in Jesus so you can be persecuted. You're not going to see too many people flocking into the church. But Jesus says it as it is. The Word of God says it as it is. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But let me just put into perspective, and I'm going to do this very quickly. Let me put into perspective, let me put into context the words that Paul says. If God is for us, who can be against us? Before he made this statement, the Apostle Paul said about Christians, that's those who confess their sin, I mean, agree with God that you're a sinner, who repent, turn around from their sin, and put their trust in Jesus. Paul said these words, and you can read it in Romans chapter 8, he says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. What that means is sort of simple. It means that because they have acknowledged their sin, because they've said to God, like Donnie on his knees, God, will you help me please? I need your help. Because they've acknowledged their sin, they have turned to Jesus for salvation, they are no longer under the judgment of Almighty God. They will never be judged for their sin. That is the promise of God. Paul says this before he makes this statement. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God's word is clear. All sin will be judged. And those who haven't received his forgiveness by trusting in Jesus, they will face death and hell. Because God has fixed a day of judgment and we shall all stand before him and we will have to give Account. Every single thought, every single word, every single deed, you will have to give account before Almighty God. But for those who have trusted in Jesus, who have received forgiveness for sins, they will never face the same terrible judgment as that of the unbelievers. That is the promise of God. Paul goes on. He tells Christians, God has declared that whoever trusts in Jesus has become a child of God. Now you don't need to get a David Icke shell suit and call yourself a son of God. 
God says in his word, whoever trusts in Jesus is adopted into my family, they have become my child. God is now their father, as Donnie says, I have gained a father. God is no longer his judge because he has been adopted into God's family. The unbeliever, however, is outside of the family of God. They are cut off from the promises of God. In fact, the Bible says that the unbeliever in this world, they are without hope. They are without all hope. If they die in that condition, if they die in that position, they are forever without hope. They will be cast into hell. But through acknowledgement of sin, repentance and trust in Jesus, a sinner, any sinner, doesn't matter what you have done, it doesn't matter how wicked you think that you have been, there is forgiveness for you tonight through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's absolutely clear, through acknowledgement of your sin, through repentance and trust in Jesus, any sinner can become a child of God. In love for us, God sent Jesus, his son, to die in our place. To pay the price for our sin. And now he declares. This is the word of God. Whoever. That includes you tonight. Whoever trusts in Jesus. Shall be forgiven for all of their sins. And have everlasting life. They are a child of God. However. Whoever does not trust in Jesus. Is not forgiven. And does not have everlasting life. But before Paul gets to this great statement, he says something else. God, he says, also gives to the believer his Holy Spirit who comes to live in them and he enables them to live the Christian life. You can't do it in your own strength. If you think, oh, I wouldn't be able to live as a Christian, that's right. You wouldn't. You need the Spirit of God to come into you and to enable you to live the Christian life. But God promises that he will give the Holy Spirit to those who put their trust in Jesus. But then Paul still goes on as he's heading to this great statement and he says this, God promises to work everything, absolutely everything for the good of those who love God. What an incredible thing to say. That means that whatever may befall a Christian in this life, whatever might happen to Donnie in this life, be it opposition, be it oppression, be it difficult, challenging times, God absolutely assures that he will work it out for good. Imagine a promise like that. Imagine God himself is telling you, see whatever happens, no matter how bad it is, I want you to trust me because I promise you I'm going to turn it for your good. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful promise to take hold of. God in everything, working for good. You know what? The unbeliever doesn't have this promise. Finally, before the great statement, Paul says, those who have become Christians, he says they are called. That means they are chosen by God. They become God's special people. They become God's special treasure. He says they are justified. It is just if I never sinned in the eyes of a holy God. He says that they are glorified. They are raised to a higher place, given a new life in Jesus. The Bible says they become new creations in Christ Jesus. That is the promise of God. And with all of these wonderful promises declared, Paul then announces to the Christian, if God, in light of everything that I have told you, if God be for us, who can be against us? If God favors us, if he is on our side, then we don't need to worry about anything in life. God has our back. And if in his love for us, God was prepared to send his son Jesus into the world to die in our place. How can we therefore not trust him to freely give us all things that are necessary in this life to help us to be the person that he wants us to be? So Christian, let's just be clear about what God is saying. These are just some, some of the many, many promises of God to you. God says... You are free from the judgment of God for sin. All of your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. 
You are adopted into God's family and you have been declared a child of God. All of your sins are forgiven. Jesus paid the debt in full. You have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit lives in you and he will help you and he will guide you. God will work everything for your good. Even all of the difficult things that you have to face in life. God promises you he will work it for your good. You are chosen. You are justified. You are glorified. If God is for you, who can be against you? That is what Donny has tonight through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as his saviour. Now let me speak for two minutes to the unbeliever. None of these promises are yours while you reject Jesus as your Lord. You are not free from the judgment of God against sin. You are not adopted into God's family. You are not a child of God. Your sins are not forgiven and you will have to give account unto God. And the Bible says you're not going to be there to explain yourself. The Bible says in the eyes of God you are condemned already. You are not forgiven. You do not have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit does not live in you and he will not help you. He will not guide you. God does not work everything for your good. You are not chosen. You are not justified and you are not glorified. In fact, God is not for you, but rather he is against you. The Bible says you are an enemy of the cross and that is why the wrath of God hangs over your very head this night. But the good news is this. To change your position, to change your condition before God, you have to do exactly as Danny Moffat did. You must do as God says, confess your sin. That means agree with God that you are a sinner. Say, Lord, I've lived my life my way. Look at the mess that I have made of my life. I am a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin and repent. Turn around, turn away from your old life. The, the Donnie went to his commanders and said, listen here, I'm having nothing more to do. I'm taking my orders from God. It's turning around from your old life and turning to the new life that is found in Jesus Christ and then trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone for salvation. There is salvation for you tonight. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how bad you think you are. There is salvation, just as there was for Donnie Moffat, there is salvation for you tonight if you will humble yourself and do as God says because in doing so, you will be able to own all of God's promises and truly say, like Donnie, if God be for me, who can be against me? If God be for us, who can be against us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, tonight we want to thank you for the testimony of Donnie, Lord, and, and how he could stand here and speak of the new life that he has in Jesus. You knew him, Lord God, in all of those days of misery. You know, Lord God, how he lived his life his way. But you brought him to a place, Lord, by your grace and your tender mercies where he yielded to you, where he gave his life to you and where you, Lord, came and made him a new person in Christ Jesus. Father, we want to thank you for Donnie's testimony. We want to thank you for your testimony in Donnie's life. It speaks of your grace. It speaks of your mercy. It speaks of your forgiveness. That he, talk, that he talked about, Lord, the... The no longer worrying, no longer being overwhelmed by this cloud of depression that he can leap out of bed now because he has a new life in Christ. It doesn't mean, Lord God, that he's not going to face challenges, he's not going to face difficulties, but he has all of the promises of God, one in particular, that even through those difficult times, you're going to work it for the good because he loves you. Father, tonight I just pray that the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would rest upon thy, and that you would fill him with your spirit and use him to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for others in this place tonight who maybe don't know you, others who are watching it on Facebook who are not yet Christians, that they would understand that there is salvation for them tonight. There is forgiveness for all of their sins tonight if they will just simply do as you have said, 
confess their sin and agree, O oh God, with you that they are sinners. Yeah. Repent, turn around from their sin and put their trust in Jesus, who is a wonderful Saviour indeed. And may they too have new life in Christ Jesus, just as Donnie has. Father, we commit Donnie to you. We commit the gospel of Jesus Christ to you tonight, praying that your Holy Spirit would take it into the hearts and the minds of those who are here, and those who are watching in, Lord, on Facebook and YouTube. And may others tonight come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, for we ask it in his glorious name. Amen. Amen.